Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. All right. Uh, so today's podcast episode is called uh, Make It Rain. <laughs> Make it rain. <laughs> Money. Money as a motivator. <laughs> 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 That's right. And today in the podcast, we're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about does money motivate people at work? We're going to talk about your relationship with money and why that matters. And we're going to talk about some implications for organizations and for us as individual people. Yeah. So I guess this paper stuff, this fiat currency makes the world go round Apparently. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for a while, we almost hit um, toilet paper as currency. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. D- different, different kind of paper, right? That's, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Then the, the bidets sold out. <laughs> <laughs> matter, matter of fact, and we'll put a link in the show notes. My, <laughs> my wife... Get, had me listen to this whole hour podcast on bidets. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh wow! Uh, apparently, it's a complex topic. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, this guy was like totally chill and like I don't know, like he could do yoga on the side, you know, getting into your zen place with your bidet seat. <laughs> but anyway, oh just my talk, God. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's move. Yeah. Uh, before Back- we. <laughs> <laughs> Today's episode is not entitled Cleaning Your Bum. <laughs> I have no idea how we ended up there. But so, yeah, we're talking about money. And uh, why don't we dive into the first part there, which is Does money motivate people at work? Well, I mean, without it, I don't know if they'd show up. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe, maybe not, right? So, I mean, people do like cash. Um, they generally need some sort of income to live. Uh, we all, uh, you know, need to have some sort of uh, influx of cash to to achieve things, to maintain some sort of lifestyle. And that's, of course, assuming that you're not some sort of trust fund kid, right? Right. I mean, gosh. No. no. That's good work if you can get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, and I think another thing that money does is, you know, people like to uh, compare themselves. And we'll talk more about this later in the episode, but people like to compare themselves with others. We like to feel like we're kind of doing okay on a relative basis. And so money is kind of a gauge of that to some people. Um, now, of course, when we're talking about, you know, uh, money and work. We're talking about kind of the work that you do for money. I mean, there's ton- tons of many examples of types of work that people do for no money, right? So a volunteer work and all kinds of charitable stuff. Um, but, you know, if you are an organization that is employing people to do things, uh, to get them to continue to do that or to entice them to do it in the first place, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, some money is probably part of what you need. Yeah, yeah, you definitely, <laughs> the the utility company doesn't accept Lilliputians or Monopoly dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. <Yeah. laughs> That's right. But, you know, it, it's this funny thing because, uh, you know, I come across uh, executives all the time and, and they, they uh, you know, they, they say things like, well, you know, we pay people to come here and, uh, you know, that that's what should motivate them. And, you know, uh, that's that should be it. You know, we shouldn't have to do anything extra to, you know, uh, make people feel like they're part of the team or anything, but they get paid. Uh, that should be enough, right? And the truth is that the psychology is pretty interesting on this, you know? Um, money, yeah, it's important uh, in terms of our motivation at work, but there are a lot of reasons why, or I think some some things we need to consider about how money is kind of a tricky motivator, and you know we actually seek a lot more than just money in our workplace. Right. So we and we talk about this all the time, and we I'm going to keep beating this drum until I stop seeing it all over. Is that managers and people in the workplace? don't have generally an evidence-based way of managing people. 
And nope. so I can't tell you how many times, you know, maybe we're doing an engagement for X, Y, Z. I'll still get asked, well, how do you get people to do stuff? You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. And then it's like, well, I don't know. You've been a manager for how long, buddy? And you're still lost <laughs> in the sauce here. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, invariably, they're like, well, well, Bill, I need like 10% more effort out of you because we can't get another head count. So can I pay you 10% more and get you to, to do so? Yeah. Uh, uh, and then it just becomes this real transactional thing, right? Where it's, hey, let me bribe you a little bit more to work harder. Um, and that just doesn't work in the long term. And you know, there's a lot of kind of dangerous myths about pay. And there's this good article in the Harvard Business Review from from a while back, actually, Um and you know this this article by Jeffrey Pfeffer. He's a um, longtime organizational behavior scholar. I think he's at Stanford now. And uh, you know he, he talks about these different myths and a couple of myths that he talks about that are really applicable to our conversation here today um, have to do with uh, how organizations view. Uh, pay and kind of why people work. So, you know, this this first myth that he he states, uh, and, you know, he, then he contrasts that with the reality. And I'll, I'll just quote this. He says, you know, one myth that uh, executives, managers have about pay is that individual incentive pay improves performance, right? So that's a myth that ind- <laughs> individual incentive pay <laughs> improves performance, uh, and, and, you know, he says, in reality, I'm still quoting here, individual incentive pay in reality undermines performance of both the individual and the organization. Many studies strongly suggest that this form of reward undermines teamwork, encourages a short-term focus, and leads people to believe that pay is not related to performance at all, but to having the right, I quote, you know, he's, you know, he's quoting there, uh, the right relationships and an ingratiating personality. So it starts to mess with kind of how we view what we do at work. Uh, It's a tricky thing. (laughs) This is all the, you've been institutionalized, (laughs) you know, because people go up in these organizations or you'll see these requests for, oh, we'd really like your, you know, help us set up an incentive pay program. Can any consultant do that. And, you know, I've seen this in organizations over and over and over. You know, one place you see this most often in organizations is is the sales part. You know, you get, I remember this one guy telling me, it's like, oh yeah, we just encourage people to, you know, hey man, why don't you get a car by the, you know, a house and a car in the country club, you know, in the same neighborhood where we're at. And, And man, once we get that sales guy in debt, he will hound dog sales. Oh my gosh. You know, and, and I, well, what kind of say, I mean, I believe he will because, yeah. you know, he doesn't want to get impounded and be the embarrassment of the town <laughs> or whatever. But, but, uh, what kind of sales he's going to go for those short term freaking, you know, whatever closes the deal now rather than looking long term and strategic. Let's grow that relationship. Right. Now, a lot of organizations have matured in mm-hmm. this, um, and are doing better. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, let's be clear, like sales is pretty darn important to most organizations. <laughs> right, right. And especially if you came out with a also ran product, but you need to get that dog to hunt. Yeah. <laughs> you can be you, somehow your competitor just made a better one. Right. So I, I we get some of that stuff. But the, the key thing is here is short term focused, And it also mm. makes that person only focused on themselves rather than, you know, What about having a junior pipeline into your sales? Well, how are you going to take those junior people, mentor them, bring them up when everybody's just focused on money rather than the broader change in the organization? Somebody that's not um, incentive pay motivated might say, hey, listen, I think we're lagging a little bit behind our competitors in these areas. You know, maybe we should take less margin on this to achieve that. And, you know, there, there's different strategic things that may not just be about that bottom line. You that's know? right. That's right. And, you know, in most organizations, uh, work doesn't just happen individually, even sales. You need to have, uh, you know, there's a whole uh, number of other people who are involved to support that sale. Uh, and sometimes, you know, there's a lot of teamwork that needs to happen in order to even ha- make the sale happen. And so if you're only incentivizing individual performance, then you can undermine that performance of the team, as uh, as Jeffrey Pfeffer points out. 
All right, and it's hard to measure this performance. And I've seen, I've seen this, well, this person doesn't sell as much. And you look at the sales data and it's like, listen, this guy's just filling and extending existing customers' orders. This person's actually kicking down the doors and cracking open yeah. brand new clients to you. Well, and so what you're pointing to there is actually a fundamental problem that I see all the time when it comes to how executives and managers look at individual performance. And they say, we need objective measures of people's performance. And that's a, uh, that makes sense, right? It, it, at least at, at first. Um, but the problem... <laughs> it's like me saying, <laughs> I need big pectoral muscles now. <laughs> <laughs> No excuses, Ben. When will I have big pectoral muscles? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. Um, so the, um, I don't know where that came from. But yeah, the uh, um, so these objective measures. The problem is that oftentimes we delude ourselves into telling ourselves that these are objectives. Like, okay, sales numbers. How could be you know what could be possibly be more objective than that? Well, just as you mentioned. You know, um, what if you know that person uh, is just extending the the current um, relationship with a, a client that's been around for years versus someone who's busting down doors? You know, I so I I had a very um, short time in a, a sales role once, and you know, I was stuck in a territory that was completely saturated by the competitor, and we could not compete with them on price on service, all these kinds of things. And, you know, I was kicking down doors a lot and, you know, some of them open, but not a whole lot. It was just a, just a dog fight to try to, to get anything done, uh, versus some of, of the other sales folks who, you know, were out in areas that where, you know, our, our competitor wasn't, uh, present. And so comparing those is not an apples to apples comparison. Right. And so no. it's not objective, actually. Anything, you know, w when we're measuring people's performance at work, it needs to be based on stuff that's under their control for Pete's sake. <laughs> well, and I, I see this on the other side with software developers. Mm. So, so this guy, well, wait a minute. I'm like 10 times more productive than these guys. Why don't I get 10 times the pay? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, we, we just pay our software developers, you know, 80,000. Um, or a hundred thousand or whatever. And then, and then, and then, you know, whoever there, you know, employee X is over this, like, yeah, I know I'm like half the productivity, but it's hard to find software developers. So I have a job, but I'm making the same money as dude. That's 10 X better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. How, how would you go measure that? You know, and that's the whole thing. It's like, we tend to have salary and pay bands and, mm -hmm. you know, it's just hard to get performance pay on jobs. Well, and, and the other thing, too, is that, you know, it, it's hard to align that performance with the incentive pay. So, you know, uh, uh, measuring performance is hard enough. I'm not saying it's impossible, but uh, it, it's difficult enough. And many organizations do it very poorly. Uh, and then trying to align that with, okay, well, you performed at this level. That means you should get X amount in terms of your, um, you know, your incentive pay. That, that's a tricky type of connection that you've got that these organizations are trying to make. And, uh, you know, even if you do it really well, it, 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 you can't just be, uh, you know, objectively fair. It needs to be subjectively fair. Like I, there's an organization that I've worked with before and they had this, uh, you know, this, this whole program for how they were going to do incentive pay and how they're going to structure their bonuses for the entire company at the end of the year. And the problem was that it was such a, a just a complicated black box of a decision making process about who got what at the end of the year that, you know, the, the perception across the entire company was basically, oh, this is just like their archaic formula that they used to, to justify giving themselves all the money and then giving us a little bit. So this this thing that was supposed to be a good, you know, because the, 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 the leadership team was like, we're trying to do this right. And yet everybody was just like, oh, well, you know, okay, you gave me a little bit, like big deal. You probably gave yourself a whole bunch more because it was just the process wasn't explained. And so I guess the point here is that, you know, Individual. That's right. If you're going to pay yourself a lot more as a CEO or a leadership of a company, just do it and don't tell anybody about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll probably find out somehow. Yeah, your yeah. employees can see through the crap and then they'll be like, you know, at least they're honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and the, the point here is that individual incentive pay is tricky. And we're not necessarily advocating for the abolition of individual incentive pay at work. 
but you've got to handle this with care. I mean, I think that's a that's a topic probably for another 12 episodes of the podcast, you know, because it's, it can be a very complex topic. Um, but, you know, going back to our topic here today is all about money. And it's about uh, this first part. We're talking about money and it does it motivate at work. And it's tricky when it comes down to this individual incentive pay piece. And that brings us to what Jeffrey Pfeffer refers to as uh, another myth that I think is relevant for us to discuss. And that myth is that people uh, work, you know, just for money. Uh, that they are uh, that money. Well, is why, why do you work? <laughs> <laughs> I, the, well, there are a whole host of reasons, right? Um, and it, you isn't know, it a hobby if you could do if you do it without pay? <laughs> well, perhaps, right? But you know, so the reality here is it's not that people don't work at all for money. The reality here, and I quote from from Jeffrey Pfeffer's uh, Harvard Business Review article, is he says, you know, quote. People do work for money, but they work even more for meaning in their lives. In fact, they work to have fun. Companies that ignore this fact are essentially bribing their employees and will pay the price in a lack of loyalty and commitment. Right. That's that whole idea. Do you want compliance or do you want commitment, right? And if you're building a safety culture, if you're building any culture that's worth having, right? Mm -hmm. You want people committed to that culture, which is challenging because one, it's got to be real. It can't be platitudes. You can't fake this stuff. Right. You can't fake this stuff. And the second thing is if you're a manager and cash is the only lever you're pulling, like go Mm. do push-ups. You know, if (laughs) if you can't be smart, at least you'll be strong. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of, yeah, speaking of pectoral muscles, yeah. <laughs> Go do some push-ups. Oh, gosh, yeah, right. So everybody only looks at money, yeah. right? And then sometimes they might be like, oh, well, Fred, why don't you get an extra 15 minutes for lunch today? Or, or you know, oh, I brought, you know, a bag of cheap candy to work, so have this bite-sized Snicker bar. Or, <laughs> you know, come on. We're right. beyond that. I mean, I'll eat all those Snicker bars. Don't get me wrong. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's right. You know, but... but you got to have more levers than that. And that's what... It's not that money is not a lever, mm-hmm. Right. It is. It's part of that. But that needs to be a port, part of a portfolio approach of what you need to do that has to do with what really motivates people, culture, alignment, a lot of other things. That's right. That's right. And, you know, uh, we, we get a lot of, um, you know, satisfaction and engagement at work from other types of sources. You know, we, we like um, being respected among our peers. Um, you know, meaning comes from things that are not even within inside the, the, the organization. It may come from, you know, other things than just what the company does. You know, it's not just like, you know, we can't all be part, for example, of organizations that are curing cancer, right? Or or developing the next uh, hopeful <laughs> coronavirus vaccine, right? I, you know, I wish we could, but uh, that's just not the case. You know, someone, some organization, and these organizations are probably quite profitable in general. I, I don't really know. It just sounds like uh, something that, I, you know, probably pretty widespread. But somebody's got to empty the porta potties, right? Right. Which is a challenge right now <laughs> because festivals <laughs> right. and everything are down. But yeah, but that but that's the whole thing. There's all kinds of jobs, right? And you can get fulfillment um, even from outside those jobs. Maybe the fil- fulfillment is you know you're providing for your home and your house right. and your family, and and you know you go and it kind of maybe a thankless role, but you come home and. And, you know, watching that look and that expression on your significant other or your children's face, you know, thanks, mom, dad, uh, you know, for the Christmas, you know, these yeah. these are things that, I mean, it's those are priceless things sure. and, and can be part of our our motivations. But we're, we're, you know, it's not like, oh, can't wait to save another thousand children today. You know, that, that's not, <laughs> that's not part. Well, and, and you know, what I tell managers uh, frequently is that one of their motivations for doing a good job as a manager and one way in which they can find uh, in which they have this huge opportunity for meaning in this world is by being a good leader and good manager. Because guess what? If you do that, if you are a good leader and a good manager, uh, you are 
helping other people have meaning in their lives and you're helping them have a more fulfilling existence at work. And you're very potentially, uh, you know, influencing their blood pressure and health in a positive way by being a good boss, right? So, you know, we can find meaning and that, that could happen in any type of organization. I don't care if you're emptying porta potties or if you are curing cancer, you can always uh, find meaning in the way you treat the people with whom you work. Um, so I think that that's an important piece here too. And it's something that we seek in our work that goes beyond this whole monetary piece. Yeah, ab- absolutely. You know, they they say, you know, people don't leave companies, they leave managers, mm-hmm. right? And I mean, that's that says so many pieces there. Like, well, if your company had a real culture, had, you know, real meaning and all that stuff, maybe they would leave companies, you know? Yeah. But because there's so much <laughs> daggone disconnect there, right? Yeah. They end up leaving managers, which means as a manager, you can have such an impact. But also as a person working to the left and right, you know, if you're just a line level worker, just a line level worker. No, if that's where you find yourself, right? As mm-hmm. a line level worker, right? You're equally valuable and you can create that value and meaning for the person on your left and right. Yeah. But- but when we look at just this money lever, right, it's not really well. Zappos, um, you know, I'd have to go look this up, but I'm pretty sure they gave people after they finished their orientation, they gave them money to leave. Not, yeah, you know, once yeah. Zappos got acquired, I don't know if that's still going on. Yeah, or I'm, not sh- I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but they, um, yeah, it was a program where you finished, I think, your first, uh, maybe like six weeks, your orientation. And then they said, hey, we'll give you, and I think it was a substantial amount. It was like a, you know, thousand or two thousand dollars and these were for entry-level folks they said hey we'll give you this money just to quit right now and you know it's kind of <laughs> an interesting thing right and we could unpack the psychology of that you know for hours uh but what they're you know trying to do is make sure that people who do want to stick around are doing so not just for the money but they're doing it for the the culture uh and for the experience that they're trying to give their customers and so forth so it's kind of an interesting um piece there that zappos does And, um, you know, I I think it kind of speaks to this idea that, you know, you don't want people just being there in your organization and coming to work every day only because of the paycheck. Right, right. And the the other side of that, right, is, (laughs) (laughs) you know, so, you know, you go through the gauntlet of interviews and all that stuff. And it's, you know, they say it without saying it out loud. It's like, well, what's the least amount we can give you to get you to come here? Yeah. <laughs> we we really like you, but what did you get paid in your last job? Because we want to just give you a, a just a smidge more than that, so that you feel like you know you, you, that it's justifiable for you to make the transition. And uh, you know, but we don't want to actually pay you what this job is worth. We just want to pay you as little as we can to have you have you toil away for us. Right. So this brings me to a topic: salary history bans, mm. which uh, you know I think there's like eighteen, nineteen states that actually it's against the law for somebody to ask you about your, you know, previous salary, yeah. right? But then I find large organizations will get by because they'll just say, oh, well, they come to our portal. And when you fill out that job application online, it'll ask you what you're currently making or what you, you know, made previously, some iteration of that. And so you don't even get to the point of being discriminated against. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're in your daggone interview. They're just like, um, not going to too expensive here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's that's garbage, because as a company, you shouldn't really need that stuff. And I, I've been in places where they're like, OK, well, the budget for this role is like 100 to 120. And like, can you believe this? This guy made 70,000 before. Well, we're going to offer him it's like, hey, hey, Bill. We're going to offer you $76,000 to come here. This is a close to a 10% raise. And they didn't know that guy had had made less previously because he had an elder care situation. And he had to just take something that was available in a small mm. town. Yeah, And so that person took it. But you know what? In eight, 10 weeks, he was gone to somewhere else for a lot more money. Right. Uh, short-sighted. Look at the value that that person drives. I mean, it's not that you don't benchmark, you know, with what a salary ban should be. But if somebody can do the job, you really freaking like them, pay them what they're worth, daggone it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's because, right. Because the word will get out about you, oh, right? Does. Especially in the IT world where people are in user groups together. It's like, yeah, you can work for that place, but they're like really 
cheapskates and have a crap culture. Uh, That's right. You know, don't do that. It hurts your brand. Make sure HR salary compensation is dialed in, but money shouldn't be the be all wherewithal because it'll bring a certain type of people into your organization. And you don't want everybody in an organization being that kind of person. Right. So going back to this question, you know, does money motivate at work? You know, I think the, the key thing to remember here is that people are complex. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different motivations. Uh, and, and guess what? As managers, you, you just can't be lazy. Uh, you've got to actually get to know your people and manage them in a way that makes sense. Uh, you know, and having that more individualized approach um, can be a really helpful way to start. And remember that, you know, it's not just about the money. Um, you know, you want to pay people enough so that they're not uh, not thinking about the money all the time, right? Pay them fairly. Uh, and then uh, there's a whole lot of other um, types of meaning that people derive from their work. And that's where you should really be focusing upon. Yeah, you got to whip out your empathy. You actually got to talk to people rather than bark orders. What? <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, don't make me talk to people. I, I, <laughs> I actually have to I actually have to understand and try to kind of, you know, empathize with the people that, that work for me. Oh, my gosh. That, oh, terrible. Yeah. You got to see them as humans. <laughs> and and, and yeah. look, if you're not doing it, you're a numbskull. All right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So let's move on now. And let's talk now about, um, you know, at a more personal level and, and, and uh, you know, how we all kind of are making our way here in society, just about this idea of um, your personal relationship with money and why that matters. Uh, I think this is just a really a fundamental and important thing for us to discuss uh, in this episode. Yeah. So, it's challenging because money gets wrapped up with all kinds of personal psychology issues. Yeah. Um, there's this one guy that started one of the larger IT national, um, at least national in the U.S., uh, recruiting firms, IT recruiting firms. And he grew up with nothing. Like sometimes he'd have to wear some of his mom's jeans and stuff like that. Mm. And he was so money motivated. I will never be stuck in this situation again. Mm -hmm. And he's grown a big company, really awesome you know, really amazing story, kind of rags to riches kind of thing. And, um, but his uh, early life experience shaped his relationship with money. Yeah. And um, other people, like the trust fund kids, so I live in uh, Park City, Utah, and we have what we call Peter Pan syndrome. These, <laughs> these, <laughs> these kids that never grow up because they just have like limitless cash and I don't know. They chase powder all, all winter. But, um, <laughs> and, you know, they have a different relationship with money. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not going to say any, I'm not going to make any moral judgments about your views of money. But I think it's helpful to stop and say, what do you want to do with your money? Yeah. What do you want money for? Is that healthy or not? Right, right. You know, and I, I think it's very important also to then just to think about, you know, this idea of, what what you have available and you know how how are you living are is your lifestyle something that is truly within your means or are you living above or below your means and all of those have some consequences <laughs> you know I, I think uh it's if you look at for example i don't have the data right in front of me but you know let's just face it a lot of americans are in debt you know, yeah, and yeah. All, all <laughs> maybe the truest, them. the truest <laughs> thing said on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, you can't argue with that one. And people don't save like they should. Um, and what that suggests to me, and I think is a fairly, um, you know, strong conclusion here is that many people, most people are living, you know, above their means, meaning that they are, um, they, they really are spending where they shouldn't, they aren't saving enough. And that, and there, and a lot of it is kind of about like propping up this illusion of, of what they have and, um, uh, keeping up appearances. And that, that just is a, that's a there, look, there's always going to be somebody richer than you. Like, that, like there's, you just have to reconcile yourself with that fact. And that's a race that you're not going to win. Yeah, we're not talking about abject poverty, which the right. data is stark. You know, a lot of people are only $20, $40 away from mm. falling into a, an abyss of eviction, poor credit that they can't ever escape. Right. And my heart is with those people. So I just want to say we're not talking about... Um, 
you know, that group of people that absolutely needs um, some kind of intervention, some kind of policy level plan, that kind of stuff. But what we're talking about, let's let's talk about like some of the numbskulls I see at Park City, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> You're going to really ingratiate yourself with your neighbors with this episode. <laughs> You know, and I I don't care because a lot of these <laughs> a lot of these weirdos with cash aren't your real friends anyway. <laughs> Let, yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah. They go to the country club, although you know younger people aren't necessarily going to these things. But you know, just so they can prance around and show off their cars and other stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So um, they don't have fiscal knowledge themselves. Maybe they sold their dot com and now they were handed a, a, you know a big load of cash. You know. And so, so one thing that you got is like fiscal knowledge isn't rampant, right? So that people don't know how to manage their money. There are sure. a- excellent, excellent books out there on um, personal savings and stuff. Dave Ramsey is a guy who is really, really quite good. And like nobody listened to him really until the, econ- the economy collapsed, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, The Four Pillars of Investing by Bernstein. This is another good book. But this is just stuff like, do you know what a stock and a bond is? Do do you know how to um, do a budget and stick to it? I mean, these are are challenging things. And I see people at all tiers of the socioeconomic, um, you know, rungs of the ladder failing on this. Um, That there is what we call the high beta rich. There's a book about that. You know... Um, the top 1% is not a fixed group. Only about 25% of the taxpayers in the top 1% remain there year after year. Right. And, and why is that? So there's this idea called hedonic adaptation, which the first place I heard about this was on this guy's blog called Mr. Money Mustache. We'll, ta- <laughs> we'll tag him. It's about growing your stash, you know, your cash stash. Yeah. But, but, you know, you... if. And we see this in the data on lottery winners. You get handed 20 million bucks, and then within a year or two, those guys are right back bankrupt. Right, right. And the idea of hedonic adaptation is this, you know, it's this idea that, you know, we we very quickly get used to uh, new st- lifestyles, new things. And, you know, you see this in the data on uh, when people get pay raises, right? So <clears throat> you give someone a pay raise, uh, does their job satisfaction and just general happiness kind of go up immediately? Of course it does. Like we like pay raises, but here's what happens, you know, it goes up and then over a period of time, it kind of just comes back down to where, you know, close to where it was before. Um, we very quickly get used to these new levels of, uh, of money and what we have. Right. We we totally get used to, you know, I mean, I remember the biggest time it's like, yeah, it's Friday. You know, I'm right out of undergrad. I'm going to get a six pack of Killian's Irish Red for four dollars <laughs> and 30 cents. And that's a whole weekend of fun for me. Right. Like I'm going <laughs> to hang out with my friends. I'm going to play some guitar. We're going to yell about politics because that's what we like to yell about. And, and like a whole weekend of fun for four dollars and thirty cents, mm-hmm. man. Maybe we get a dollars Totino's pizza, but I, I don't. I don't know many people in their fifties. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> you know what? A sixer of Killian's and a dollar Totino's frozen pizza sounds like a banging weekend, right? <laughs> and, and yeah, but here's the thing: I bet if you ask those people, and if they were honest with you, they could probably remember. You know, assuming that they had also kind of gone through, you know, times when maybe they didn't have as much, they would probably remember some of those times with fondness, and and kind of like you are with your six pack of Killians. And part of that's you know due to just that we remember things more favorably than maybe they actually were. But um, you don't know, dish the Killians. The, yeah. the Killians was the bomb. <laughs> Still is. <laughs> So, um, you know, but but I think there is a lot of truth here in this idea of hedonic adaptation. And uh, what that suggests, at least to me, is that, you know, if I'm going to pretty quickly adapt to any new income level, um, then, you know, maybe pursuing new income levels isn't kind of the end all and be all of my existence. (laughs) Right. Well, and look at the doctors. And so I and I found this with a, a lot of my friends where. Their parents, the, the only acceptable um, job for them was doctor, lawyer, or so, some other, oh, does it make a lot of money? 
And, and mm. you know, their parents really, really put that in. And to be fair, some of them were, you know, first, second generation um, immigrants to the U.S. and stuff. And so they had a certain thing about getting that certain income. But 10 years into being a medical doctor, and they're coming unglued. Mm. They hate their life. They look at their house, and they look at, you know, all this stuff. And, and like, really, they just wanted to be like a classics high school teacher. Yeah. <laughs> You know, teach Plato and Aristotle to the next generation of fertile mm. minds, which is awesome, which is fulfilling, which so, you know, it's you really need to take a look at your relationship with money. There's different paths for everyone on this. Right. And, you know, we're not talking about income inequality in this particular episode that requires its own handling. But if you could do something else, and that's why I like Mr. Money Mustache, he definitely has my kind of values. Um there are ways in which we can hack our living to be able to live within our means, save so we can actually retire and and do those kinds of things. So just a, amassing stuff and wealth and trying to keep up with the Joneses isn't going to buy you the kind of life that you're going to find fulfilling, right? That's right. And, you know, what's interesting, if we look at some of the research on the relationship between money and happiness, uh, what's interesting is that, um, you know, a, a, the acquisition of more things uh, does not have a, a you know, a, a consistent relationship with being more happy. Um, in fact, there's, there's some good evidence, and there's a study that we'll uh, link to. This is from a 2008 article in uh, Science, uh, looking at, you know, this idea of spending money on others. And what it suggests is that when we spend money on other people, it actually has a bigger positive influence on our happiness than spending on ourselves. You know, um, I, I'm not sure why, um, you know, every every director of annual giving at, at, at charities should be citing this this finding everywhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you give us money, you're going to be happier. But but th that's what the data seem to suggest. Um, you know, we like to to give and that actually makes us more happy in the long term. And there's also um, related evidence um, to suggest that, you know, when we spend money on, for example, experiences instead of on things, we, we tend to uh, remember those with, with more fondness than, than just stuff. Um, so, you know, this goes into this idea of how your relationship with money also includes how you spend it if you got it. Right. So, and, and let's just do a bit of a reality check. If you've got 4,210 bucks to your name, which, you know, if you sold your car, a lot of people are going to get that much at least over it, right? You're richer than half the people in the world, mm. right? Wow. Um, and so you just need to have a, this, like, look, at, well, you know, what do I really need to be happy? We see this movement of early retirement among some people, you know? I'm going to work in tech and, and bank it for five, six years, then I'm going to go live in a really small town, and, and, you know, just work part-time at the ice cream shop down the road. Sounds great. You know, I'm tired of dealing with these bosses that think money is the motivator all the time anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think your, your point there uh, is really important. You know, if you have just $4,210 to your name, you're still richer than half of the world's residents. You know, for those of us in the United States or in other developed countries, um, we have to remember that we have a lot. Uh, and that being grateful is really important. You know, sometimes in my, um, in one of my courses that I teach, uh, you know, I, I talk about, you know, the importance of gratitude and how it's very important for dealing with stress and well being. And I say, okay, we're going to take five minutes and I want you to write down, uh, everything that you're grateful for. And, and, you know, they'll kind of look at me and, you know, so, and, and I'll, I'll say, well, here's one place to start. I'll say, you know, you are right now sitting in a classroom at a, uh, a, a good university in the United States. You have already won the lottery. And they just kind of like, uh, yeah. they're like, you know, they're like, whoa, you know? Yeah, but, and I, I see that in Park City. My yeah. house is only $2 million. <laughs> Jordan just listed his for $11 million down the road. And you're like, dude, <laughs> you're in Park City. Yeah, you're already here. Yeah, you, you already made it. You are here, right? Yeah. You you have made it. But but that's that points us to the other side. So we're just talking about 
okay, I get it. So, you know, if we had a super fulfilling job at the local nighttime coffee shop and we worked with really cool employees and we had really delicious ramen, I mean, okay, I guess we could get by and be happy. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, Ben, our listeners get that now. But if you're making a bajillion dollars, Mm -hmm. all right, or if you're going from 2 million to 10 million salary, what what happens on the other side of that that frame? Well, right? I mean, so there's some evidence to suggest that when you make more money, it may actually reduce your experiences of savoring, you know, uh, in everyday joyful experiences, um, just that everyday stuff that we have. Uh, you know, there's so there's um, one study in particular. It's a 2010 article in Psychological Science, and we'll we'll post a link to this in um, in the show notes. Uh, but, you know, one thing that they, they found, uh, so they did a bunch of interesting things, but one piece of, of this study is they, they did an experiment and they found that participants, and I'm quoting from the abstract, we found that participants exposed to a reminder of wealth spent less time savoring a piece of chocolate and exhibited reduced enjoyment of it compared with participants not exposed to wealth. I, it, so, I mean, this is a tiny little piece and there's, you know, a lot of kind of other uh, things we need to consider in terms of, you know, how generalizable that is to the general, you know, the, everyone else in our experiences. But, um, you know, it's this idea that when you have a lot, you're going to start taking stuff for granted. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's that's just a an important thing to remember and to try to, you know, keep in mind that just having more is not going to make you happier. That's right. So the mindfulness movement, all of this stuff is trying to unpack what is really a complex relationship with money, Mm -hmm. right? And so all we're saying is, so one, does money motivate people at work? Yeah, for a variety of reasons. Well, you're a person that has to go to work, so you need to unpack your own relationship with money so you're not just in this rat race mentally that you know, know where you're going and why you're trying to get there. Yeah, yeah. And this even speaks to these really fundamental ideas of identity and who you see yourself as, who you want to become. And, you know, these things like wealth, things like your looks and your status, um, these are, you know, fleeting aspects of of who people are. And um, I think the evidence is fairly conclusive that these are not solid things to build your life upon. Yeah, a long time ago. There were three jobs. We'll call them butcher, baker, candlestick maker. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was did the butcher ever son ever go like, I don't know, Dad. I want to make scented candles. I just really <laughs> think I got to do that, or my life is trash. You, you just don't understand, Dad. The, like that's no. <laughs> well, you know, well, maybe I don't know. The, some of those scented candles are pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. The Yankee Candle Company or whatever. But anyway, <laughs> the thing is, is, you know, there are fundamental things that make you valuable. Are you the type of person you want to be? Do you treat other people the way you want to be treated? These are core. Everything else, I'm not saying it's not important or doesn't have an emotional impact, but every other piece of that is just decadence. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, which means if you want a solid foundation and we talk about being differentiated so you're not emotionally infected by others and and that you're able to chart your life course, Mm -hmm. you've got to be founded on something solid internally. For some people, that's their faith. For some people, that's some kind of code of conduct that they just will abide by. Other people has like degrees of integrity and those kinds of things. Dig into those things. And then everything else is just icing on a cake. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you could be, you know, a team of nomads tracking across the desert, hoping you find an oasis for water. You know, mm-hmm. we live in such a modern, decadent society that that's not without struggles. But if you want to be solidified within yourself, you got to go to those core elements. That's right. Yeah. And there's never uh, anything wrong with helping other people. You know, Um, if you do find yourself in the lucky situation of having more, um, helping others is a very good thing to do. And the data suggests that it's going to help you um, actually be more satisfied with your life. 
Right. And, and so do do better financially. Yeah, and th- there's nothing there's nothing wrong with trying to better yourself financially. Like I, the, I really the first don't. step there is financial knowledge. Gosh. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, hoping to sell a dot com one day is about my chance of being, you know, for most the odds are about you probably be, have a better chance making it in the, in the NBA or something, right? <laughs> so, I mean, there's not a whole lot of people that, that just get handed that stuff. And if you do, you got to be prepared with that financial value anyway. But that leads us to a whole other topic is, you know, how much should somebody be paid? And, you mm. know, I get this, you know, you know, as we're both in the military, Ben, and I, you know, people say, well, we're spending too much on the military. Okay, well, how much should we spend? I don't know, less. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not very concrete and it's just tied in this uh, sentiment. And right. but the same thing with compensation and pay. And it's like, well, I'm not paid enough. Well, how much should you be paid? Well, that's going to always be a moving target. Right. right? These things, yeah. These things are relative oftentimes. Um, you know, and I think when you, when, one part of your relationship with money and one part of how you view um, work and so forth, I I think is well summarized, or I think a good place to start is to realize that people don't owe you stuff. You know, you know, person, (laughs) no, no organization, uh, they don't owe you anything unless you provide value. I mean, this is kind of this is like the entrepreneur's mindset that I think a lot of people don't have, right? They they think, oh, well, I just show up and they pay me. No, no, the, the, really, the the better approach is to think that no one and no organization owes you anything unless you add value to that organization and to other people. Um, and if we we approach our lives and what we do with that type of idea, I, I think a lot of the other things take care of themselves. Right, man. We need we need to do several episodes on. On the money thing, I, I think. So <laughs> I, I think we've skinned the cat enough for this one. Sorry, that's probably a bad reference. But uh, <laughs> no cats were harmed in the filming of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So I, I think we can move on now um, to, you know, what are some implications of um, you know, your relationship with money and how it works as a motivator and what it does for your happiness? What are some implications for organizations and for us as individual people. And so maybe we'll take that first piece of what are some implications of these ideas for organizations? And, uh, you know, I think the first thing is how you view that employee and employer relationship. You know, what is the philosophy there, right? Right. Uh, There's so much that gets communicated with the way that you handle money. Um, My cousin owned a box company. And he had the option. This was years and years ago. Um, He sold his box company at this point. Um, But he could pay his guys more or provide them with health care, right? And he was one of the landmark employers in this small town, right? So he knew all these people's families and stuff. And he kind of felt it out. If I remember the story right, he kind of felt it out with some key employees. And everybody just wanted more money. But he's like, wow. man, what happens if this guy gets hurt? And the, I know their families, their kid plays baseball on the baseball team with my kid. You know, like these kinds of things. So he didn't. He made sure people had health care. Mm. And, you know, that communicates something about how he sees the value of the people that worked in that organization, Right. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of this idea. Is it just kind of a transactional relationship that you have with all your employees? Or is it something more about mission and vision and and trying to, um, you know, get people behind an idea and something that's providing meaning uh, within their lives and maybe within the world at large um, and and how that influences, uh, you know, how you view compensation overall. Uh, You know, another really interesting thing that you and I have discussed is, you know, what if organizations themselves actually took a bigger role and a bigger interest in encouraging financial literacy for their employees? Right. Right. You know, I'm always so surprised about this. What What if instead of raises, but if you're underpaying your guys, you need to give raises, guys. Don't be morons with that, right? <laughs> so, but what if you help maximize their compensation by giving them retirement education, not just, oh, well, we'll pay for a financial planner, but what if you actually, actually, actually made 
financial education part of their employee development. So, hey, this is, let's talk about how do you calculate how much you need to retire? What goes in on that? Yeah. Um, how and doing, should you and do, do a budget yeah. or savings? Yeah, you know? and doing the, doing this in a, a a real way, not just, oh, we, we have, as part of our you know employee development program, we have some online videos for you to watch on these topics. That No, I, I think what we're talking about here is here's an actual way to deal with your own real situation and help you to, to get on the path towards understanding what's going on with your budget and everything like that. Um, I think that could be a really powerful thing for organizations to to do uh, and it, and it does a number of things. One, it helps those people just manage their, their funds better, um, but it also communicates that you actually give a rip about them. Right, right. Get holistically, yeah. give a rip. And and so, and here's the thing too: is look at the salaries in nonprofits and government work. Mm-hmm. They're, they're generally less than what they are in the private sector. Of course, when right. the private sector, you know has a bad time, they're always like, look at these overpaid government. <laughs> when times are good, why would you take a government job? It's stupid. They don't pay anything. When times are bad, they're like, well, there's overpaid governmental weenies, <laughs> right? And, and But this points to a thing. And, you know, everybody talks about these dumb government employees. And I just want to say, listen, the stupidity spread all over the economy. <laughs> Private, public, it's, it's I know everywhere. It, yeah, I mean, I know a ton of really smart, awesome people that work in the government. Yeah, People that want to describe what trade relationships should be with Turkey or, oh, well, should this be handled by the Hague Convention or traditional treaty? These kinds of things, that takes a nerd of the highest caliber, right? Right. And they're not getting paid a whole lot. And, but they're doing it because they, bel- they have the expertise, they believe in the mission, they believe in what they're creating there. That's really awesome. And the best managers that I've talked to in government nonprofit work are able to tap into that love of mission mm-hmm. to recruit some of the best talent in the world, honestly. Right, right. Yeah. And I think uh, another thing that organizations need to be thinking about with regard to how they deal with with things like incentive pay, things like uh, compensation overall, um, kind of their compensation philosophy, if you will, is thinking about the the cultural issues that that can come around, right? If you are um, in terms of how you're incentivizing people, and you know, you see this sometimes in sales organizations that it can really start to uh, create a, a culture that might not be what you want it to be for the long term health of those people and for the organization. Right, and you can shape by developing this financial culture within your company, you can actually help people take that home to their, you know, families and communities and influence the broader perspective and and be a force for good in your community on that stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's turn now to some implications that these types of ideas have for all of us, the individuals out there in the world trying to trying to make our way. And, you know, one piece of this is, you know, the the data really suggests that you should be mindful of and careful about uh, who you surround yourself with. And this is what we would call in in the world of social psychology or sociology, your you know your social comparison group. Um, you know, these are the people who you see on a regular basis, the people who you, uh, you know, um, go to church or uh, other types of civic organizations and you know, those people that you associate with. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing is, is that if you're always surrounding yourself with people who have, uh, you know, more extravagant lifestyles than you, um, who, you know, drive the, the, the cars that, that are uh, nicer than yours or whatever, and if you actually care about that stuff, you know, that can start to be a bummer. It can start, you can start to lie to yourself and make you think <laughs> that, that you need more. And, you know, when we, when we get in that mindset of kind of just always trying to keep up, um, you know, that's, that's a really dangerous, I think, um, uh, long-term proposition for your, for your happiness and well-being. Yeah, there was a movie, and I think it was called The Joneses, right? Um, that, you know, it was all about this fake family that would go in and try to get pe- rich people to buy a bunch of stuff. All the, uh, and, and it ends up sadly with a guy that's very very wealthy next door getting into so many debt so much debt trying to buy all this stuff he he drowns himself in his pool oh my gosh you know and and 
it, you will end up killing yourself if that social comparison is what drives you. Some people just, if that's an innate part of your situation, don't throw yourself in at the bottom of the totem pole somewhere, right? That's going to be bad for your, bad for your psyche. But I personally take the reverse of this. I love this. So, and Ben and I kind of have the same value. Ben, how old is your car? <laughs> well, um, one of them is now 12 years old and the other one's 10. Right. So yeah. I, I've got a 99 CRV that's Whoa. probably worth 800 bucks, but that thing is still going. <laughs> of course, that thing spends more time rotting in airport parking lots uh, than I, I actually do driving it in a given year. But, you know, one of the things that I really liked about that as somebody that's still in the National Guard is I see a lot of young people make bad decisions with cars. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, I, I, you see that across the military actually fairly regularly. Um, you know, because, Every, there's a lot because they know Uncle Sam's good. If you go to, uh, you know, foreclosure or whatever like the uncle sam will pay some of those bills and get it back from the soldier yeah or you know at least you know people um who are making uh you know doing the financing for vehicles um they know that they can have uh you know wages garnished and so forth if this person is in the military and so it's just this nasty situation but yeah you see these um you know folks and, and it's funny because by you know, in the military we all know exactly how much everybody else is making you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's you just a, go, how long you've been in the service, sir? 12 yeah. years. Okay. Oh, three. And they can just pull it up. Yeah. And they, they know exactly <laughs> how and, much and, you're making. Yeah. And so you see this person and, you know, they're, <laughs> you know how much they're making. And then you see their, you know, $40,000 pickup truck. And it's like, okay, probably not the best idea there, shipmate. Yeah. And, and I actually, so this is one way in which I changed the culture um, in mm. my unit. So, you know, I pull up in this dumpy car and, <laughs> They're like, they have a car that's sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. You know, trucks were so big in Alabama and Tennessee. Like, oh, my. And, and trucks are so darn expensive. Goodness. Right. Thanks. You know, they're, they're strapped for cash, but yep. and they have to commute one and a half hours one way to their place of work where they're not making a whole lot of cash. And they're driving the least gas-efficient vehicle <laughs> to do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, dude, you're spending 400 a month on gas. Oh, my gosh, you know? So that's a lot of beer money. That's a lot of retirement <laughs> money, you know? Yeah. But, you know, I'd love to say stuff like, oh, man, I wish I could afford a, a car like that. <laughs> you know, and, and they know I'm making more cash than they are. And, right. And then it kind of has them pause or, hey, hey, sir, why are you driving that junky old car? And I'm like, yeah. man, because I want to retire. Yeah. You know, and, and just you're, you're changing that financial status Social comparison. I love awesome. having the crappiest car on my block, actually. It, <laughs> it, it is a point. So social comparison, I'm like, you yeah. know what? It's awesome. Well, you know, and there's examples of other very wealthy people. And we're you know on the topic of cars. I was thinking, isn't there, I don't know if this is legend or if it's true, but Sam Walton apparently used to just drive his little dumpy pickup truck everywhere. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if there's a similar thing about Warren Buffett or whatever, driving the same car for a long time. But, you know, I, I think there's some wisdom in not caring about some of these things and maybe even taking that a step further like you did and trying to, um, you know, change a little bit of the cultural norm about what what should be going on and what people should be caring about. So, yeah. So when you're doing the social comparison, like we were talking about the high beta risk, that means one group of people aren't rich from year to year to year, mm -hmm. right? And I see a lot of this. People come in, they get newly made some money, sold a company, or their company's doing super well. They immediately live up to, you know, borrow even against the highest amount they Ugh. can borrow. And we know there's going to be a change in the business cycle. Matter of fact, a lot of what drives the business cycle is this kind of debt-fueled spending. Yeah. And so when the business cycle corrects, well, where's all my friends in the rich neighborhood now? Oh, they're, they're all <laughs> foreclosed because... And this is the problem with deifying wealth as a signifier of a person's quality. Yeah. So people try to fake what they're not. And, and what a dumb thing to fake, too. Because more money doesn't make you a better person. Nope. That's very well said, you know. And um, if you're thinking about it just from a pure happiness standpoint, there's another article that we'll link to in Psychological Science, which actually, you know, suggests that, 
Yeah, it, you, it's you, kind of your rank of income that matters more than your absolute income for happiness, which means that, you know, this this comparison piece matters. If you're always surrounding yourself, if you're always having your, um, you know, nose being shoved in the fact that, you know, you're one of the have-nots among a bunch of the haves, you're going to not feel so great about things. Um, and so, you know, pick your, I guess, your friends, your social groups um, wisely and choose to be around those people at least this is my my approach towards those people who have similar values. And some of those people, you know, I, so I have, you know, friends who are all across the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, but I think the common thing that I find across the ones with whom I, the, the people I like out of those are the people who do have these great values. I know some very, very wealthy people who have amazing values and live their lives in great ways. I know there's some people who are on the lower end of the spectrum who, you know, same thing. Um, so I think identifying on those types of criteria is much more, much healthier for the long term than basing things just on what people have. Yeah, you know, I enjoyed that. One of my thing, I used to be a music minister. My undergrad's actually in sacred music. And um, I would meet with wealthy people uh, in the church for fundraisers. And mm-hmm. I thought, oh, well, a lot of these guys, because they had the same kind of values, they sang in the you know church choir, we liked music, uh, were really awesome, interesting people. And yeah. their wealth wasn't what made them interesting. Now, some of their interestingness <laughs> led to some wealth, for sure, right? Yeah. But we we got along fine. Same thing. I love the outdoors. so And I like to go backcountry ski touring. So sometimes you'll run into somebody out on a skin track and and... Hey, how's it going? Well, you find out later that guy was a CEO of a company, but uh, outside of that person, maybe having slightly better skis than everybody else, you know, <laughs> we're all just having a good time hitting the slopes. You know, we're not even paying for a lift ticket. We're walking to the top of the mountain to ski down. So, yeah. you know, these things are a love of the outdoors, uh, caring about the least of these in your community. Like these are important things that can that's a better thing to socially compare yourself to than, well, who's got the latest Tesla or some garbage yeah. like that? Yeah, I would rather, you know, surround myself with people who have, you know, who I admire for their values and integrity. And then I, you know, <laughs> that'll make me feel like I need to do better in those areas versus the financial piece. You know, another thing is, too, I think that, you know, we talk about living within or below or above your means, if you can live below your means, meaning that you could afford more, but you're choosing not to, that can really be a great strategy if you can swing it. You know, take that extra money and, you know, again, we're not, uh, you know, the financial experts trying to tell everybody how to how to do all this stuff right now. But, you know, if you can save a little extra, if you can live below your means so that you can save some for a rainy day, do it. Yeah, so on the values front, mate selection, who you're going to, significant other <laughs> shack up with. I, I don't care what you want to call it, but if you're going to financially intertwine your life, right, mm. with somebody, this is one of the most key ways in which you can derail financially. Yeah. Divorce, it, so here's a quote um, from Stanford economist Rod Chetty, I believe. I've only read his stuff. I, I, I don't maybe be pronouncing that wrong, C-H-E-T-T-Y. Mm-hmm. But he says the rate of single parenting is in turn the single most significant predictor of social immobility across counties. Yeah, so I mean, but that's worth repeating. So it's it's the rate of single parenting is the most significant predictor of social immobility, right? So being a single parent makes it tougher, right, to move up the socioeconomic ladder. That, right. That's pretty huge, right? Right. So, I mean, there's, okay, so you navigate all this stuff with organizations and, okay, well, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of influence over how they do their compensation or if they have a culture that's worth a crap, right? Yeah. But there's so many things you can do by assessing your relationship with money, having a good budget, comparing yourself on values, but you got to pick the right person that you link up with. Like, this is the biggest deal for your life, right? Right, right. And, you know, if, if you don't, if you come from a background, maybe you have a, a broken home, you don't have, didn't have good examples from your family of, you know, maybe your parents didn't choose wisely when, when they, uh, when they chose each other. I mean, there's some, a lot of situations that can be like that. Um, or if you come from, you know, a more broken type of situation, you may not have these skills to, you know, understand, you know, the, the importance and some of the things that you should be looking for when choosing that life partner, that mate. Um, But you can learn some of these skills. 
Right. Two books I want to highlight here are um, 12 Principles for Making Marriage Work by Gottman, very evidence-based. He runs this organization called The Love Lab. Um, And another one is Passionate Marriage by uh, Dr. Schnark, S-C-H-N-A-R-C-H. You need some evidence-based. The the love tips in Cosmo aren't going to get it (laughs) for you. If you didn't, you know, I come from a broken home. I had certain things that I had to go through. Divorce is super prevalent in the U.S., So that's okay. You can learn those good relationships, behaviors, and how to do it. And one of those key pieces that a lot of places, once you run the gauntlet of how to get over your family of origin issues, right? (laughs) The the next piece is having similar values on money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and that's a big place where couples uh, fight in a relationship. And so getting financial literacy, marrying somebody with financial literacy can be super super important here. That's right. And these are skills. These are things that you can learn. You know, figure out how to do that budget together. Have have a shared understanding of how you're going to deal with these types of matters. Uh, and so, you know, you've got to talk with, about these issues with your partner. And I think the earlier you do it, the better. Um, maybe do it before you enter that that legal or, you know, coming from my perspective, that sacramental bond with someone, uh, you probably should figure out if you're going to be aligned on these issues before you take that leap. Right. And and one of the things that a lot of people say, well, you know, the upper class think about things differently. I'd say that's true for the legacy wealth. You know, people that have figured out how to transfer an estate generation after generation has they might have an, a little bit of an OS there, right? Operating mm. system of how to think about wealth, how to go about doing stuff. But I can tell you a lot of these rich people, you know, some of them own companies and stuff. They don't have a financial flipping clue, man. You know, you can't. <laughs> <don't> even, <laughs> so it's like that whole like rich dad, poor dad. Like, I mean, there's some good lessons in there, but sometimes you get around a rich dad and he's just a numbskull that inherited it and it's going to lose it all by his end of his life. Yeah. So that's where you can pick those values early. Um, chart your course. Don't compare financially to the person on your left and right, per se. Compare on values. Be, keep becoming a better person. And marry somebody that that's wants to be on that kind of ship with you. That's right. You know, and so it comes back to, you know, figure out what your own goals are for yourself. You know, get those skills that you need. Um, you know, have have a plan that you have developed that you can live with and that, you know, if you're if you have a, a life partner with you, you know, that you can figure that out and work yourselves, um, you know, according to that plan. And, uh, you know, build, you know, be, be like the piggy who built a brick house <laughs> I <don't, laughs> because, because that's not going to blow, that's not going to blow down as easily. Right. <laughs> yeah. Which is weird. Cause my kid has, I'm like, all right, we're going to read the story of the three little pigs. But, uh, in the brick house, eventually all the other pigs come and get in the house with them. And even the wolf sets up. It's a part-time mooch. <laughs> Every, everybody wants the brick house. <laughs> yeah. That's to- oh, totally socialist. Three little pigs. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's great. All right. So uh, today in the podcast, we talked about making it rain and this idea of uh, money as a motivator, right? (laughs) Right. And so so we talked about, does money motivate people at work? Sure. And how do you, should you look at that as an individual and as an organization? We talked about how your individual relationship with money matters and why. And then we talked about implications for organizations and for us as individual people on navigating that space. That's right. And all these topics, of course, so important to this whole idea of flourishing at work and beyond. Thanks for listening to the Indigo Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.